Hello, everyone. This is Kristen Huber, and on behalf of Enlight Software and 451 Research, I would like to welcome you and say thank you for attending today's webcast titled Reducing Risk in the Data Center with DSIM. Leading off the discussion today will be Rhonda Esserto, who is Research Director of Data Centers and Critical Infrastructure at 451 Research. Following Rhonda will be Mark Gatos, who is Chief Marketing Officer at Enlight. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Number one, after the presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A period. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. We'll respond to all unanswered questions via email after the webcast concludes. Second, this presentation and slides will be made available to all attendees once the webinar is complete. And finally, please provide feedback at the end of the webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rhonda. Thanks, Kristen. Hello, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Rhonda Asserto with 451 Research, and I'm going to spend about the next 10 or 15 minutes talking about DSIM, Data Center Infrastructure Management Software, and how it can and is being used by all types of data centers to drive down risk. Um, I've talked to many, many users of DSIM over the years, and while the focus of the software can often be around efficiency gains, it's clear that risk reduction is a key, key benefit. Now, it's not by any means a hidden benefit, but it's perhaps a lesser known one. So I'm going to be talking specifically on how DSIM reduces risks. But before I get into it, I'd like to begin with our level set on failures in data centers. Because unless you're making a point of tracking failures, you might be led to believe that they happen infrequently. But it's actually quite helpful to track these things to better understand what risk in a data center actually looks like, what it actually means, what are the causes and the consequences of outages, why do they happen. So our sister company, the Uptime Institute, has been tracking data center failures amongst its global network of data center operators for more than two decades. I can't share the details of that data because they're often under confidentiality agreements. So instead, we compiled a list of the biggest outages of 2017, and that is they were big enough to make the headlines. So these are just some of those examples. And bear in mind, most don't make the headlines. So if you look here, just in January, there were eight major public outages just in January. And you know, the point here is don't do business in January because it, it just, keeps going. Um, and as I move through these, you can see that there are outages all over the place with all different kinds of brands from industry leaders to small government agencies. And you know, this is an industry where by and large, we generally believe that we've got availability figured out. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. Um, you know, given the investment and the innovation and the focus on availability, we as an industry shouldn't be going down at these rates. And here's some data from the annual uptime survey by the Uptime Institute. And an outage here is defined as an IT service being lost because of an incident. And you can see that 25% of those survey respondents reported an outage. That's a huge number. That's way higher than you know, we would have expected. And in analyzing this data, we found that if you had a tier certification, you were slightly less likely to have an outage. But if you were part of the Uptime's end user group, the network, you would have had about half as many outages as other folks in that survey. Now, I would argue that's because that network were paying attention. They're focused on this as a group. We also did a quick analysis of the causes of the outages. And you can see that the two biggest causes are really entirely preventable, power outages. Now that's the whole purpose of a data center is to keep the power on. Millions of dollars are invested in trainings and equipment and drills and processes and procedures, and yet it's the leading cause of outages. And the second cause is the foundation on which all third-party data center services live, networking and software. And looking at this data further, we estimate that at least 38% of those outages were due to human error, including the two biggest high-profile incidents, AWS 
and British Airways. And, you know, oftentimes it's the technicians, um, or in the case of AWS, it's the person on the service desk with the fat fingers um, who are thrown under the bus for these outages. They make mistakes, oftentimes during routine maintenance. But, you know, it's the processes in place that enable those mistakes to have a ripple effect into operations. And ultimately, that's the management mistakes. It, it's preventable. It's not the fault of the person who made the mistake. It's the executive who shortchanges training or tools or cuts to staffing budgets. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's management and operational processes that were lacking, and there's a lack of visibility into operations in real time that enables things to escalate. So what is an event? Here are just some examples. You know, servers are being moved or they're being turned off or on or removed. Um, they've got a thermal issue in, in a rack, in a row. Um, you know, customers are uh, have over provisioned on their IT requirements. Um, typically, several of these things are happening at once. And that can make it highly chaotic. So if an incident does occur, the ripple effects can be dramatic and you know, resolving those uh, to reduce the effect of an outage um, is, is problematic to say the least. I'm just gonna pause here and I, I'm really curious to know what your organization's strategy is for data center risk reduction. So this is an IT risk reduction, it's data center risk reduction. So if you could use the, uh, uh, the, at the bottom of your screen, there's a way for you to vote on these. Would you say that your organization is placing data center risk reduction as a priority and that you're actively investing in new tools, policies, and technologies? Or two, it's a priority, but you're not actively investing? Or three, it's not a priority today, but you expect it will be in the future? Or four, it's not a priority? So please do go ahead and vote using the, uh, using the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna to get to the results of those while everyone's uh, uh, voting on that uh, at the end of the webinar. And I'm really curious to see what the results are because it goes without saying that um, data center risk also includes security. And security, of course, is a huge issue for all of IT. But in data centers, it's a bit different because it's not about the data per se, but it's about the security of the equipment. So for data center management, security equals uptime, it equals availability. Now, I know that's a bit simplistic, but that is the main concern. And it's going to get worse because there's more software and equipment, there's more centralized management, there's more remote automation, there's gonna be more edge, more IP, more common APIs. All of these things are growing in data centers. But here's the thing, we don't have any data showing a single hour of downtime caused by a malicious attack be it internal or external. Now, yes, that could be a reporting issue, but even so, not once in a long time has that been reported. Now, this isn't a cause for complacency though, because data centers are really like other industrial facilities, where there are many attacks, breaches, and vulnerability reports. And that's including on systems you wouldn't expect. Uh, and what I'm showing here is an old screenshot of the website Shodan where you can go online and you can discover the location of Modbus or Ethernet or all kinds of equipment, including in data centers. And once you discover it, you can get its IP address and its location. And then if you were to try um, a few simple things like sending out default addresses, you could potentially find your way remotely into a data center and to significant portions of a data center and you can seriously cause strife. It's scary um, how open some of these things are and how easy it could be to do. So even though nothing like this has happened that we know of yet in a data center, um, the, the threat is real. And you know, the point I just wanna make is that responsibility around this, it can't be outsourced. Real time mission critical systems should be kept close and they need to be well managed. So let's dive into, you know, what do I mean by that and how can DSIM actively reduce risk? So when we look at the buying triggers, why do people buy DSIM? Why, you know, why do they invest in the software? Then these are the most common causes. 
the most common triggers. And at the top is an availability crisis. And what this shows to me and what we often hear is that data centers have become too complex and in many cases too big to manage without DSIM. And the risks are far too great. The number of events and potential events and the speed of them is overwhelming for mere mortals. Visibility and control in the form of data and analytics is critical. And this is only going to intensify as more and more workloads are cloudified. Now, our, work, our research and others show that workloads are becoming cloudier, be it on-site um, or off-prem or in a colo, and that many workloads are spanning multiple locations. Now this creates challenges on a number of levels. Workloads are harder to predict, they move around more, they have unpredictable swings in power use, and failures can have greater knock-on effects. In order to support this, in order to support cloud-friendly workloads and data centers, you need real-time operational management and intelligence reporting. And you know, I'll just say before moving on from the cloud, the cloudification of data centers, is that while at one point we saw public cloud starving data centers of investment, but now we're seeing that it's driving management modernization, um, both in co-location, on-prem, and indeed in the big hyperscale cloud, cloud data centers themselves. And more and more of these facilities across the board are relying on DSIM. So how does DSIM reduce risk specifically? Well, let's start out by focusing on visibility. With DSIM deployed, you're able to visualize your capacity, which means you can avoid over-provisioning and the headaches that go along with that. With DSIM, you have constant operational status, which means you have immediate notification of issues and anomalies, which means you're able to understand the issue better and respond appropriately and quickly. Um, power paths, network connections and dependencies, including for workloads. And this is done when DSIM is integrated with ITSM. And we're seeing more and more of that happening. So what that means is you're able to map workloads to physical equipment and the dependencies throughout the power chain and the facility. And you can therefore place workloads and equipment in the best possible uh, location and indeed venue. You can confirm, you can predict, you can preempt, and if there is an issue, you can do um, an efficient traceback. Uh, DSIM some, is now starting to, with some of the more sophisticated systems, is able to provide real-time visibility of redundancy, which means you can remedy potential issues before they happen. And DSIM increasingly is also ena enabling automated, codified, work orders that are traceable. Now this means you can reduce errors, particularly at that human level. Um, you can speed resolution of any errors that are made and you can have faster time to recovery. So that's how DSIM reduces risk in terms of uh, visibility. Thinking about insights and data analytics from DSIM, when you deploy DSIM, Effectively, you're enabling fault detection closer to the IT load rather than relying on a BMS or some other system. And what this means is you're able to detect issues at the rack level before it has an impact on your thermal management system and indeed other domino effects. DSIM enables root cause analysis, which means faster remediation in the event of an outage or some kind of issue. Uh, sophisticated DSIM systems also have functionality around what if scenario planning. What if I put this equipment here? What will be the knock-on effect? And again, this kind of means you can avoid errors um, from the outset. It also means you can determine operational thresholds, optimal thresholds, which you can then use for your processes and procedures, particularly around max camps. Uh, a newer feature to DSIM, and again, it's not available in all systems, is predictive fault analysis, which means you can understand which devices in the power chain are at risk and why. And another new feature is failover simulation. So you can predict, uh, excuse me, you can simulate a failover situation, which means you can predict 
Therefore, which servers and workloads would be affected and who in the organisation would need to be notified and put processes in place um, in case that happens. It also means you can work, you can move workloads um, accordingly and you can remedy those situations before you actually get to the situation of needing to fail over to ensure that if you do have to fail over, it's going to be effective. Some decent systems also have predictive capacity analytics, which means you can determine if, when, and how a data center will reach its limitations. Because data centers tend to run out of either power, cooling, or space at different times. But it doesn't all happen at once, typically. And being able to understand that means you're able to effectively plan and provision workloads uh, to avoid there being any issue around capacity limitations. It's also called, you know, time to zero. Other ways DSIM reduces risk is through integration of DSIM data with data from other systems, particularly ITSM systems. And that's where we're seeing most of the integration happening with DSIM. Because as I mentioned earlier, this enables you to map the workload to physical assets. So you can ensure that there is availability of data center resources and you can ensure that your IT services are performing as expected or as designed. In other words, you're able to more effectively match the supply of data center resources with demand from IT. And you can do that in real time, which significantly lowers your risk of um, there being uh, over provisioning. Integrating decent data with ITSM data also enables you to shift load, uh, including in real time and preemptively. So you may have a notification of an anomaly in, in a part of the data center. And if you have decent data integrated with ITSM data, you can see which workloads could be effective. And for mission critical workloads, you can preemptively shift them uh, to lower your risk even further if there was some type of issue um, that eventuated. Some decent systems also enable asset integrity monitoring. And what this means is you can prevent unauthorized physical devices being added into areas they should not be in. And I know that some data center operators are also integrating decent, decent with their video surveillance systems. And this means they can quickly identify which equipment and which workloads are at risk and they can again remedy them um, more, more effectively and more quickly. So let's just stand back for a moment and consider what these capabilities mean from a business standpoint. What is the price of not having real-time and historic data from DSIM software? Well, one of the most common things that we see happening is that databases very quickly lose their accuracy, which means that analytics and reporting can't be trusted or it's limited. Now, I've listed here some of these business costs um, of a lack of trusted information, and it varies. At best, it can mean just a chronic hassle that costs operator time, but on the extreme end, it can mean an outage or it can even mean unnecessary construction of new data center capacity. So these are the most expensive consequences of not having um, data from a, a DSIM system. So this is our data center maturity management model and it maps data center efficiency and agility to different levels of DSIM deployments. At the bottom, level one, which is basic, is assuming no DSIM uh, has been deployed. And level two is where basic DSIM capabilities um, have been deployed and typically that enables operators to react more effectively when there are issues. The next level up is where a sophisticated and comprehensive DSIM platform um, has been installed. And that's the level of DSIM that I've been just talking about in the previous slides. The point here is that while this maps out efficiency and agility, it also applies to risk. Level three deployments can enable significantly lower risk profile for a facility than level two. Now, level four is where automation comes in. And you know, there's a lot of talk about automation, but in reality, relatively few data centers today are doing automation at scale. But it's certainly where the industry is heading. 
And level five, the self-optimizing autonomic data center, that's, that's, that's aspirational, okay? That's more of the long-term future. From a tool's point of view, uh, this, is, this is one way to look at it. Level two is where DSIM has been deployed to aggregate, normalize, and analyze facility and operational data. It enables that reactive stance toward risk. The next step up, and this is typical for many uh, DSIM deployments, this is a typical step fashion for DSIM deployments, is where DSIM is integrated with other data, including IT data, as I've discussed, as well as business and financial systems around costing. And this integration enables what we call a DSO approach or data center service optimization. And from there, uh, automation and controls can be put in place. So just to take away, to sum up, data center risks range from power outages to critical equipment protocol attacks. And many, if not most of those outages are entirely preventable. Data centers increasingly will be cloudy and this throws up new challenges and greater complexity, which means that uh, good operational intelligence becomes critical. DSIM reduces risk on several fronts, as I've discussed, from monitoring and alerting to risk analysis and predictive analytics. Um, and I just want to finish up by saying that DSIM is a critical component of modern data center management. Uh, I don't know any highly efficient, low-risk data centers that don't have DSIM system in place. So before I hand this over to Mark, I just want to go back to our polling question. Uh, so just again as a reminder, you know, which, which would you, how would you best categorize your strategy toward data center risk reduction? It's a priority and we're actively investing in new tools. So that came in with 50% of the votes. 50% half of you said that, yep, we're actively investing in new tools, policies, and technologies to reduce risk. But close behind that, at 45%, folks are saying it's a priority, but we're not actively investing. Um, no one said it wasn't a priority. 4% uh, said it's a priority today. It's not a priority today, but I expect it will be in, a, in the future. So. Mark, that's, uh, those results are uh, somewhat encouraging to know that half, half, of, half of our audience is actively investing around this. Um, but it is disconcerting to me that the other half um, are not actively investing. Um, and, you know, for even that small percentage, where it's not even a priority. Um, Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the, the good news is that a majority of folks see it as a priority. And, and whether you have budget for it or not, that's a, that's a different issue. The, the good news, I have to say, uh, no one said it's not a priority. On the other hand, <laughs> we're having a webinar on the topic of risk. I sort of expect people who are interested in risk to attend. So it may be uh, um, <laughs> something that's just self-fulfilling on its own. So, but like I said, a majority of people by far are interested in, in uh, the topic and uh, obviously are concerned about it. So. I want to emphasize to everyone, uh, we try to keep a pretty short webinars in general. We like to keep it to 30 minutes. So please feel free to submit questions. We, we're going to leave a little time here at the end for questions. Uh, my name is Mark Ados. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Enlight Software. And uh, we want to thank you again for, for joining the webinar. Again, if you have any questions, please feel, to, feel free to submit them. We love to have questions. It's uh, great to have uh, an active engagement with folks. But I'm going to give you a quick introduction to who Inlight Software is and how we use our software to help mitigate risk within um, companies' physical computing infrastructure, whether that's in your own data center or whether it's in co-location facilities. So quick overview of Inlight. Um, uh, Inlight Software helps companies really automate the management of their physical computing infrastructure. As I said, whether it's in your own, own data centers or it's in co-location facilities, the company's been around about 13 to 14 years. We have over 300 customers, approximately 350 customers, who are using our technology across the world. Uh, some of them are the most valuable companies in the world using our technology. We're on the ninth generation of our technology. This is all we do. We are passionate about data center infrastructure management. We have more folks focused on it, more engineers, more people in support focused solely on helping companies with the challenges around managing their physical computing infrastructure. 
We have a 98% customer retention because we're so passionate and the software works. We have a near 100% deployment record. What that means is people buy our software and it gets deployed. We just don't end up being shelfware like some software companies do. And our software is offered both on premises or in the cloud. So you can, you can take it either way. Some companies use us actually in both. Uh, and we provide a very modern architecture as Rhonda was talking about. Typically when folks deploy a decent solution, they wanna tie into other systems, whether it's BMS, ITSM, financial systems, virtualization systems. We have a very modern architecture that allows you to easily integrate as well as a variety of pre-built connectors to tie into systems like ServiceNow, uh, HP, um, um, BMC, and so forth. And the solution is very scalable, we'll talk about that in a second, and secure. So as a result of this sole focus, we've developed a rich set of technology that um, we support in the data center what we call the entire asset life cycle from dock to decom. From when assets roll into your back dock, throughout all the different stages, eventually through decommission. So helping with capacity planning, thermal management, power management, cable management, doing migrations and consolidation. The modern physical uh, computing infrastructure can get very complex and there are a lot of moving parts. We really help manage all the different stages and all the different processes that are occurring there. And as a result, as I mentioned before, we are fortunate to have some of the best companies in the world using our technology. We are fortunate that these folks turn to us and allow us to provide our software. And they range in size, right? Some as small as managing 25 racks in a single data room to companies managing up to 100,000 racks, up to, we actually have one customer who's looking to go 150,000 racks across many data centers. And as you can see, this is just a partial list of some of the companies who use us. They come from a wide variety of industries, financial services, federal government, consumer, travel. But what they all have in common is that they've moved out of the world of manual management of their physical computing infrastructure and are using software, are using InLight to manage that physical computing infrastructure. And so relaying back to what Rhonda had said, we, the greatest risk to, to the physical infrastructure is people, right? In general, technology is very solid today. It's people that introduce the most risk, right? And it's usually authorized personnel making incorrect changes. They did the wrong thing or they did unauthorized changes. We're all familiar with people who come into the data center, uh, could be business users who say, hey, we own this asset, we're gonna move it without necessarily telling the data center or the infrastructure team that they're doing so. So people introduce changes, they make changes to assets, they make changes to software or firmware that can affect operations. They also often have a difficult time keeping up with cybersecurity updates and firmware updates at the physical level. And so really it's these unplanned changes by humans that often introduce risk and at minimum create chaos for anybody who's dependent on that information. If you're going to a specific location in a data center or a co-location facility looking for a specific asset and it's not there, well, then it's a little bit of chaos that's been introduced for no particular reason. And a lot of times the problem stems from the fact that folks are dealing with manual solutions. They're trying to make their BMS system try and work as a decent solution, or they're using spreadsheets or Visio drawings. They're really just trying to use these manual approaches to handle what is really a relatively sophisticated problem that requires software, that requires collaboration, that you want to implement software to handle the problem, right? You want a modern approach to how you manage your, your physical computing infrastructure. And if you think about it, you know, the big rage people talk about is the digital transformation that's going, inside, going on inside corporations. Your physical computing infrastructure is the foundation. You don't want to be using manual methods like an Excel spreadsheet to manage all these elements. It just doesn't allow collaboration. It doesn't allow you to be proactive. And ultimately, if you have a piece of software like Enline, 
that allows you to tie into these other systems. And it becomes a central nervous system feeding financial systems, ITSM, BMS, and uh, virtualization systems in a bi-directional fashion. And so, again, sort of touching a little more deeper dive on, on the topics of how DSM helps uh, reduce risk with your physical computing infrastructure. If you just think about it, when a company, I always say just using basic DSM gives you basic data center hygiene. That goes a long way towards helping hardening your systems and reducing risk and reducing risk vectors. And so the first thing you get is a source of truth is everybody's updating the same system, you're collaborating, you're working together. Everybody's working from the same base of information, which helps really reduce risk that people are going to do the wrong thing. Then you begin to understand power and asset dependencies, where you could have potential issues. Maybe you've got critical workloads running on systems that don't have power redundancy. So again, you get greater transparency. <laughs> Excuse me. And then you, as you move deeper into DSM, you can begin to monitor um, if new assets are introduced, do you, do, through discovery, do you begin to see assets you didn't even know existed that perhaps are not being managed? And there's nothing like risk of having assets that are not under management, right? You can monitor changes. People may be removing assets or moving them or adding them that they aren't supposed to that can cause issues for other systems and can potentially overload power, create thermal issues. So again, through discovery, you begin to get transparency on what's happening live. Then you can also monitor real-time changes to your power chain. Are, are you seeing uh, potentially risky trends, and power spikes occurring immediately, or you could see trends building where you could have a potential power failure because of this. One of the things Enlight allows you to do is power failure simulation. You can actually fail particular systems and see if there's a cascading impact. Again, allowing you to get ahead of risk that can be introduced to your power chain. And then lastly, in the process, once as sort of Rhonda was talking about, you reach this level of sort of automation, you can begin to have the system alert people, send them very specific workflows when you see risk start to begin to occur. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can get ahead of these issues when you see um, potentially risky trends occurring, you can actually fire off a workflow, have somebody go and investigate it and report back what has occurred and how they're mitigating that risk. Again, creating sort of a more automated system that's getting ahead of these potential risks before they turn into major outages or major negative events. So if you would like more information about um, Inlight, read some real world case studies of, of organizations who are using Inlight today, or you'd like to see videos of people talking about what they're doing to manage their physical computing infrastructure, head over to inlight.com and just click on resources. We have a variety of case studies and videos and white papers on the topic to help educate yourself. And so I want to leave you with that slide. I, I, we're running out of time here, but I, we did want to get to some of the questions. So I'm going to turn it back to Kristen, our moderator. Kristen, can you uh, uh, let us know if we got any questions? Sure, we do have a few that have come in. So the first one is for Rhonda directly. Many BMS providers are adding advanced features like analytics to their platforms. If a data center operator has found DSIM to be cost prohibitive, have you found operators optimizing existing BMS systems to provide more DSIM-like features? Interesting. Yeah. So thanks for that question. It's one that uh, it's a perennial question. And the simple answer is um, we find that uh, more sophisticated BMS systems, even less sophisticated BMS systems, um, folks trying to use those for DSIM like functionality, um, it, it, they end up being sort of a gateway drug to DSIM actually, because there are limitations with BMS data. And even with analytics around BMS, while they are becoming more sophisticated, um, it, usually for organizations, what they find is that they have a little bit of more, a little extra data. Um, it's not always in, in the format that they need it to be. Um, it's not, so therefore they can't necessarily use it in the ways they want to. 
and that typically means that they understand um, the power of, if, if they could have the data, um, the breadth of data and in the formats they wanted, um, that usually whets the appetite and budget is usually found for um, a dedicated application and platform in the form of DSIM. Um, there are a couple of issues with, specific issues with folks um, trying to optimise uh, their BMS systems. They don't, um, as I've alluded to, they don't have um, all the data and it's not all in one place because, you know, BMS is effectively, you know, it's a bunch of PLCs, right? And so even if you put in a new one that has analytics, you tend to only get information, um, particularly around, um, you know, your, your, your mechanical systems. That tends, tends to be the strength of BMS. Um, and so you have a lot of other data, um, including around your electrical and your operation um, procedures. You can't readily integrate those into a BMS because it's not a platform. It's not software. It's not, it's designed for, you know, specific purpose. Um, it's not designed as a platform for integration. Um, so you're also not able to do uh, really valuable things around predictive uh, forecasting and analytics. And you don't have a holistic view of your capacity. It's still only part of the, of the picture. So the short answer is um, we do find operators looking to, trying to do that with their BMSs, um, but almost always uh, it leads down the road to, hey, we actually need a more comprehensive system. We need um, a holistic view, and we also need to be able to exploit that data readily, including in real time, and that's just not available yet, um, or, and I don't think it's the role of BMS. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Well, I'm going to jump in here also. This is Mark. You know, when you get down to it, this is sort of, in, in essence, becomes a build-by question. And I, one thing I'd like to point out is I think decent solutions used to be years ago extremely expensive. I think the prices have come down uh, substantially. But ultimately, the value you get is from a system that is dedicated to that specific purpose of helping you manage your physical computing infrastructure. And, yeah, sure, you we, we run into folks who, talk about extending their BMS or extending down their ITSM. And you can do that, but then you begin to get into the world of becoming a software developer. And most organizations want somebody who is an expert at that, do it like a, an inline software. But I, I would strongly urge you to engage and find out if, if the value proposition works for you. Every single customer we add, and we add about a customer every week at inline software, they want an ROI analysis, right? And they have BMS and they have ITSM, yet they still turn to Enlight because there's an ROI and there's a value proposition that means there's a gain for them to get from the deployment. But thank you for the question. Great. And I think we'll try to answer one more question. Um, Mark, I think this one probably is for you. Um, how can DSIM help with physical security, such as perimeter security for EG? Well, I think really it gets down to um, when we're, what we're dealing with on, on an in-light perspective is we are dealing with the physical assets within the organization. What we're doing is helping you manage the physical assets within your organization, whether those are servers, racks, cablings, and power. And so um, there are organizations dealing with entry into the building and video surveillance. That's not the, the technology we provide. We're helping you manage the physical assets. Now, we can tie into those particular types of systems, but ultimately we're helping you manage assets that are being introduced in the data center floor, maybe perhaps being removed, being changed. Any type of, of changes, whether they're planned or unplanned, we help you really manage that. And so it's about really the, the assets within the building, again, when it gets into you know, access to the data center for video surveillance, that's something we would typically tie into. I hope that gives you an answer. Perfect. Thank you, Rhonda and Mark, so much. Um, that concludes today's webcast. And as a quick reminder, the on-demand version will be available on Bright Talk shortly. And on behalf Preston, of Enlight Software... I would, I, would like oh. to, I would like to jump in here and just say one thing. Oh, sure. We've gotten a lot more questions. We, we definitely have seen oh. more questions than one. We will get back to everyone on the, all these questions, right? I just want to make sure I said that, but you might have been planning to. <laughs> nope, that's perfect. Thank you so much.
And again, on behalf of Enlight Software and 451 Research, thank you so much for attending and have a great day.